Okay. Um, okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. Oh, that went live a lot faster than it usually does. Wow. Um, so thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, this is John with Murder by the Book coming to you for our second author event of the year. Um, we're so excited tonight to have uh, Lee Goldberg and Matt Coyle with us. We were just talking before we went live um, how disappointed we were that we're not actually able to do this uh, in the store. So how are you tonight, Lee? I'm just great. And, and by the way, don't Matt and I look like typical Californians, bronze, <laughs> surfer boys? I mean, we just, we really wear our state on our bodies, don't we? Yep. Think about renting out space on my uh, white billboard forehead. <laughs> and all I things considered, we're, I think writers are, are the best equipped to deal with the pandemic. We spend all of our times in our offices, in our heads, making right. stuff up anyway. Right. So it, it's not that big of a stretch for us. No. Yeah. Uh, so tonight, Lee is going to be talking with us about his new book, Bone Canyon, which uh, just came out. Uh, he is a two-time Edgar Award and two-time Seamus Award nominee and the number one New York Times bestselling author of more than 30 novels. He's also written and or produced many TV shows, including Diagnosis, Murder, Sequest, and Monk, and is the co-creator of the Mystery 101 series of Hallmark movies. As I said, um, Sequest and Monk, my husband's ears just perked up from the couch. Um, <laughs> is your husband in his 80s? Yeah. <laughs> you listed all the credits of one of the most popular retirement homes. Yeah. Are you um, a boy toy, young boy toy lover? Yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, McKenna and her husband, Steve, just um, as part of their COVID stuff, just binged all of the Monk, book, uh, all of the monk uh, episodes like really early on in the pandemic. Um, so as an international television consultant, uh, Lee has also advised networks and studios in Canada, France, Germany, Spain, China, Sweden, and the Netherlands on the creation, writing, and production of episodic television series. Uh, you can find more info about him at leegoldberg.com. Um, and we're also excited to have Matt Coyle with us tonight. He is gonna be talking about Blind Vigil. Uh, he is the best-selling author of the Rick Cahill PI crime series. His novels have won the Anthony Award, the Seamus Award, and the Lefty Award, as well as the San Diego Book Award, among others, and have been nominated for numerous Anthony, McCavity, Seamus, and Lefty Awards. Uh, Blind Vigil is the seventh in this award-winning series, and Matt is a graduate of UC Santa Barbara and lives in San Diego with his yellow lab, Angus. How are you tonight, Matt? Great. So after, after Lee, you had to fill in the rest of the stuff, like where I went to college, I have a dog, you know, because Lee's feel, Lee, Lee, you could have gone for another hour and a half. <laughs> Me, you got to pop it up a little bit. Yeah. I'm hurt that you didn't mention that I went to college <laughs> and that I have a dog. Clearly, you're giving Matt preferential treatment, and I'm not sure I can stick around for this. Uh oh. You have two dogs. <laughs> so, to give all the dogs then equal billing, Lee, what are your dog's names? My dog's name is Elfie, and he only speaks French. Um, we had another dog who passed away recently, but but this dog we inherited from my mother-in-law who was in France. And when she passed away, we agreed to take her dog. And he doesn't understand English. You, you've got to say, you know, a seat for a sit, you know, and a rat for a stop. And uh, he's always smoking, always drinking, only eats croissants, wears a beret, which I think is a little much. I mean, come on. A lot of heavy cream. Yeah. Butter. Yeah. So uh, for everybody who is watching us on Facebook and YouTube, if you have questions for either Lee or Matt, please drop those in the comments. Um, I've already posted links where you can visit the Murder by the Book website to order books from either author. But again, if you have questions, please post them. Um, we will get to those in a little bit um, after we've had a chance to chat. So to get us started, Lee, can you tell us a little bit about Bone Canyon? Yes, I can. I'm so glad you asked. It's about Eve Ronan, the youngest female homicide detective in the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. And she didn't get the job because she's brilliant at detecting or because she's been in the department for so long. She got it based on a viral video that was shot of her off duty uh, arresting a award-winning movie star who was beating up on a woman. That, that video went viral and she was able to leverage that popularity into a promotion she doesn't deserve and doesn't really have the experience for. So she's constantly having to prove herself to everyone around her and even to herself. She has innate skills, but they're rough. She's not Harry Bosch yet. She's not Rick Cahill yet. And in this book, the sequel to my uh, novel, Lost Hills, it's it's the end of a, a massive wildfire that spread through the Santa Monica Mountains, leaving them black and naked. And after all that brush is burned away, bones are revealed. And, and this is based on a true, true story. It happened here. 
uh, when where I live right in the Santa Monica Mountains, and we had this horrible fire. And sure enough, once all the foliage and brush was cleared away, they found a lot of death. People who didn't die during the fire, but bodies have been dumped in the canyons beforehand. Um, perfect. And so, Matt, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Blind Vigil and what um, Rick is up to in this one? Sure. Rick Cahill is, uh, this is the seventh book now, which is just like a year. It took me a lot, 10 years to get seven books. And for Lee, that's about two years. Um, <laughs> Rick is I'm not that uh, slow. Pardon? I'm not even that slow. <laughs> uh, Rick is a former uh, cop who uh, was a cop up in Santa Barbara where his wife was murdered and he was, this is years ago, he was arrested for the murder, never tried, never exonerated, but released. So he's had that baggage for quite some time. And in the last book, Lost Tomorrows, he goes back to Santa Barbara. He's now down in San Diego, he's a private investigator. He goes back to Santa Barbara and actually solves her murder in some ways, but something dramatically happens to him at the end of the book. And you might have an idea of what it is. The title is called Blind Vigil. So he, he's lost his eyesight and he's he's decided that he doesn't really want to be a private detective anymore. He decided that before he was even injured because of decisions he's made and people have gotten hurt. So he's trying to find his way. And ironically, he's probably in a better emotional situation than he's been in years because he's in a stable relationship. Uh, and um, but the one thing is he's trying to find his way. And he's as he's ticking along, his wife is back in Santa Barbara. His wife is uh, girlfriend's back in Santa Barbara where she's trying to, uh, she's a, um, she's an internal decorator and, an uh, internal decorator. Yeah. I can't even think of the, yeah. What do you call it? A decorator. Can the, you uh, decorate my colon for me? She's a, uh, she, she decorates people's homes. <laughs> um, it's in the book. <laughs> That's, I've never seen that in a crime novel before. An internal decorator. In the book. Yeah. You can, uh, you don't really want to see the internal part, but, um, so he's home alone and uh, he's trying to figure out what he's going to do. He's blind and his his former sometime partner, Maureen McFarland, comes to him with a case he wants help on. Um, he, uh, Rick's former boss when he managed a restaurant, Turk Muldoon, is, uh, has asked, hired Moira to check up on his girlfriend, which to Rick seems very unusual because Turk's never really had a relationship where he cared that much. So Moira asks Rick to come along, and even though he can't see, she wants to get a feel. Well, you get a feel for whether he's telling me the truth or not, because the last domestic thing she had, uh, she found out the wife was cheating. She told the husband, the husband killed the wife and himself. So she's a little skittish and wants to make the right decision. She brings Rick along, and bad things ensue. I have to hand it to you. You know, I I I was nervous when I read your book. Because you know the, the the hero who gets blinded is a trope. God knows, even I did it. I wrote the monk goes blind episode of of monk. I think I even wrote the blind episode of Flipper. But every show does the the blind episode. I thought, oh God, Matt's doing the blind book. Uh, it was terrific. I, I really enjoyed what you put him through. I thought you would just you know do all the terrible stuff that I did when I did the the blind episode. But you you really found a way to take. What could have been a, a cliche and a tired trope of of the detective genre, and and made it really compelling. I felt like I was blind along with with Rick Cahill. Well, thanks. High praise coming from you. Yeah, I mean, it. it to, I didn't. I wasn't even thinking about about writing it, the blind episode. Um, but it's just uh, like things pile up for him. Every bad decision he makes has a react. There's a response to it, and he ends up getting shot and, and going blind. And um, Believe me, I thought it was a great ending of the last book, but when I had to write this book, I thought, oh. you're an idiot. Why I don't want to give away what happens in this book, but this detective takes so much physical abuse in your series to up the ante in the next book, you're going to have to amputate a limb and beat him with it. I mean, really, you really knocking this guy out next time or or shooting him is not going to be enough. You're going to have to emasculate him. I, I, I think the next book, Ballless Vigil, will be really, really exciting for the Rick Cahill fans out there. Well, you know, you gave me a hard time. You sent me an email and mentioned that, but then I'm reading, uh, I read both uh, of the Eve books, and uh, he breaks a from... sternum, a sternum. If it went well, in your book, her book. heart would have been taken out and stuffed in her nose. It's only her second book. Wait till she gets to five and six and seven. <laughs> And by the way, okay, so we're there. Sorry, John, but we're it's there. Okay. Go for it. I, I, I thought I thought I, I had questions for Lee. Well, I thought what he did with, I thought what he did with the book was fantastic. 
especially the way he helped he handled secondary characters. But there was a moment where I had to suspend, I had a problem suspending my disbelief, where it, this won't ruin anything, but there was a character who fell over a McDonald's like um, <laughs> a ramp, a two inch uh, handicap ramp and had injuries that to me were unbelievable. I didn't think it could possibly happen. So you lost me a little bit on that one, Lee. He's referencing the fact that a character, a side character in the book, uh, <laughs> trips over the handicap ramp at McDonald and breaks both of his arms. That happened to me. <laughs> I broke both of my arms, getting my daughter a happy meal of doom. And uh, I'm still milking it to this day. It was 14 years ago, but I, I still get all the mileage out of it I possibly can. I'm well, sorry. I've stepped at all, we've stepped at all the questions you've prepared. Well, I, I apologize. I will. No. <laughs> I am glad that you left out the kind of nuts and bolts of how the wife had to help you out in, in yeah. what we had to read. So that's that's good. <laughs> I kind of had, I so like I said before we got started, I have a handful of questions because I had a feeling that once we got the two of you guys going, I wouldn't actually have to do a whole lot of work. So it's totally fine. Um, so since um, Elise talked a little bit about that, um, Matt, can you tell us about some of the challenges of writing your main character blind and how that changed kind of how how you would write a character? Right. Yeah, of course I did my, <clears throat> I did my research and I met a, a, a one via tele telephone and one in person, a couple of women um, who lost their vision during adulthood. And I got a lot of information that way. Um, but really for me, ironically, the difficult part, one of the difficult parts of writing this book was I had my my lead character, Rick Cahill, in a different position he's ever been in. Like I mentioned earlier, he'd solved the whole uh, arc of his, which had been the, the thrust of all the six books before was this um, dark cloud of what had happened to his wife, how he felt responsible for not being where he should have been the night she died. And then finally solving that case, he gets a sense, a little bit of sense of redemption. He's kind of in a, emotionally, like I said, kind of a decent place and I've never written him that way. <clears throat> so in spite of the fact that he's, he's blind and can't figure out what he's gonna do, he's actually a little lighter than he's ever been in any other books. But of course, you know, the big thing was, you know, I gotta write a character, I gotta write a PI more or less, although he does get a lot of help he, from Moira McFarlane, who's trying to solve a case and uh, try to make it somewhat believable. And um, as I said, I, there is a, at the end of Lost Tomorrows, there was a possibility this vision could come back. So I thought, well, you know, why don't you, it's been nine months. Why don't you just say his vision came back between books? Well, I know that would be a cop out. It would lessen the uh, extent, lessen the impact, I think, of the ending of the last book. So I really had a hard time doing that, you know, writing scenes, um, scenery and things. And so I was so unsure of, of, that, of whether he could carry, because he wrote, it's in first person, of whether I could carry the book with just him blind talking, that I brought in a third, uh, secondary, I brought in a, a third person character, a bad guy um, that I wrote for a while. And I really liked him because I didn't think it, it was strong enough. Otherwise, then I finally, after a hundred or so pages, I just, I stopped writing that character and I pulled him out because I realized once I, once I just put Rick's situation into Rick's, the way Rick thinks, I was able to do it, but it was it was a challenge, that's for sure. And I was quite worried about it for a long time. Uh, Lee, one of the things that I read about um, when you were working on the first book in this series is that you actually got, speaking of research, you actually got to go to a seminar for professional homicide investigators. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about that? It was great. It actually was an outgrowth of, of an event any writer can go to, which is the Writers Police Academy. And I strongly recommend you do it. It's the best conference you can ever go to because it's held at a law enforcement training facility in, in different places each year. But next year, it's going to be in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And it's great. You get to fire guns. You get to analyze blood spatter. You get to drive a police car and do the pit maneuver. You, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, conference. But while I was there, I befriended a lot of the police officers and also the, in, the instructors who, who work at the actual um, law enforcement training facility. And one of them said to me, you would just love the homicide investigators training conference. I mean, it's, it's limited to, to professional police officers, but you'd love it. Well, gee, thanks for telling me I'd love something that there's no way I can go to. Anyway, what do you mean there's no way you can go to it? I run it. I can invite anybody I want. So I got invited to this homicide investigators training conference. Now, what you have to know about the training seminar is that homicide investigators need to go to 24 hours of education every year just to stay on top of things, sort of recertify to stay on the cutting edge of investigative techniques and new laws and what have you. And I don't think they like going. And I went to this event. It was also in Green Bay. And you could tell who the cops were. I mean, a lot of them were wearing guns and badges, 
but they also had the look, you know, the, the stare and the, the body. And then there's me. Hi, I'm Lee Clifford. You know, I, was, I was clearly not a homicide detective. And you can tell they didn't want to be there. But it was like being the new kid in a new school. I ate breakfast by myself at another table. Um, but it, when the, there was a case presented there um, as an example of why it's important for every homicide detective to approach every homicide as if they've never investigated a homicide before, to set aside any homicide investigator common sense, or they would not have been able to solve this particular case. And the case was presented by the investigating officer, the uniformed officers who were there, the blood spatter analyst, the prosecuting attorney, the whole team was there for four hours to walk us through all aspects of this case. And I was just fascinated by the case. And I had come there to research a whole different book, but when I heard this case, I just I threw that book out and I started seeing how I could base a book on this case and a character that would be perfect for this case. And I asked lots of questions. And at lunch, I went up to the lead investigator and asked some more. And he said, you know, your questions are great. May I ask what uh, agency you're with? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm a senior investigator with the WGA. <laughs> and he went, I'm not familiar with that agency. And I said, Writers Guild of America. And he said, you're a fucking writer? <laughs> yes. He said, how the fuck did you get in here? And I pointed to the guy who ran the conference. And the guy who ran the conference kind of went, <laughs> and the detective, well, if he likes you and thought you were good enough to be here, so do I. And, and, he, and he said, keep asking the question. After that moment, just like high school, people saw me with the with the cool guy and then everything was fine. I was embraced. And then at dinner that night or you know, in the bar that night, I bought everybody drinks. And when they found out I was from Hollywood, Suddenly, I was the most popular guy in the entire place. But I learned so much. And I didn't come back and just blurt all that information to my next book. It's there to inform what I do. Right. I'm a big believer in research. But to get the one telling detail, the one smell, the one taste, the one cobblestone in the street, whatever, that will give the, the story the reality as a foundation so that I can BS you about everything else. Uh, you know, my books are not remotely realistic, but if I can get you to suspend your disbelief because of that little interesting fact that, that makes you believe that you're in, in Paris or makes you believe you're at a crime scene or whatever, then I've got you. Mm -hmm. And th that Homicide Investigators Training Conference was just fantastic. And I've, I do a lot of that. I, I, I do a lot of interviews. I do a lot of reading. Um and again, it's just so I can imbue my fiction with just a scintilla of truth. So since you since you mentioned, um, you know, kind of that the case that they were talking about being the thing that kind of helped inspire when you're writing a, a book that's kind of inspired by real events, how much do you keep the same and how do you know how much you should change and how much you should keep the same? Well, Lost Hills is inspired by a real case. Uh, Bone Canyon, my new book is not. The only inspiration really is the the, uh, the dead bodies, the, I should say, the, the skeletons that were found in the canyons by my house, and that just sort of got me going. Yeah. Um, but from there, I made it up. Lost Hills was based on a real case, and that case was so utterly bizarre that if I had actually written about that, no one would have believed any of it. <laughs> so I just took the aspects of that case that I liked, and I and, and there were things I compressed and wanted to move, and I, I, I brought the case from where it was set, which I, if I remember it was Ohio, and brought it back to Los Angeles in the same way that their case is based on rip from the headlines and law and order and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I asked all the people involved in the case, I told them what I intended to do to fictionalize it and if they would help me. And they said, yes. And to my surprise, even though the case was fictional, my book, they told me that what I wrote was more realistic than the nonfiction book that was written about the case. Wow. So that, that was a that was a compliment. But I, I just want to get the attitudes right. And and some of the things that people believe are the most bizarre about that book, about Lost Hills, that they think I made up, were not. The, the most bizarre stuff is true. The the character the character, the killer, I'm not giving it away, the killer is found pretty early on, had a gorilla suit in his closet. <laughs> No one ever figured out why that guy had a gorilla suit in his pocket. So I a pocket, a closet. That's why I came up with it. But it was it, it was a, an amazing case. And how about you, Matt? Have you ever used any kind of rip from the headlines um, things to kind of as a basis for to you to get a novel started? Yeah, actually, I did I, my second book, um, Night Tremors. I just want to make a quick uh, comment about what Lee was saying in your question to him is that 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 research really shows in the book 
and I was doing what I do and I read it. I don't write police procedurals. I don't think I ever will, but you know, I know you to know about, I have a friend law who was an ex cop. I have Dave Putnam who everybody knows ex cop, but you know, I got to do my own research without cheating with people. And, um, but I do cheat when I'm like, I read Connolly. I'll, I go, I didn't know that. And I'll dog ear the page. Uh -huh. I was dog ear and pages when I was reading this book too. You could tell, you could tell that was well researched. And like Lee says, the important thing is that you just don't want to be a data dump on all you learned and you just drop it in where necessary. I thought that was really well done. But my second book, Night Tremors, I took from a case, um, the show Nightline of 48 Hours. I'm sure they, they both did shows on this guy, and I think it was Pennsylvania or New Jersey. He was about 16 or 17. And he was convicted of murdering his parents. And, um, but they, you know, how they, those shows, they give you a, a point of view. And the point of view, their point of view was this guy's innocent. And you're watching it. And at the end, you're thinking, God damn, this guy's in jail for life and he's innocent. What can I do? You know, I would get online and try to find out things I could do. And they, both um, networks would follow this for years, and it must have been like seven or eight years. Every year, they'd have a, what's going on now with the case? I felt horrible for this guy. And so I took the premise of, of this guy, of this of that murder, and um, I stuck it in, I, in Night Tremors. Of course, I twisted it around and made it made it my own and, and, and tweaked it. Um, but the good news is that the kid actually was released from prison, I think after he'd done 12 or 17 years or something. But yeah, I don't, I don't go a whole lot out of the headlines, but um, I do, I do take some internal things from my own life and then really blow them up, you know, like a little thing that's a nice little story that you might in, in, um, entertain three or four people out of 15. You know, if you blow it up, you can probably get the whole 15. So I've taken a few things from my I own life. I saw a lot of aspects of your own life in uh, Blind Vigil. A lot of the background of, of Rick Cahill is you. Oh, it's true. Except you don't have a gun. And as far as I know, we I haven't talked have about this lately, you haven't murdered your wife or been accused of it. Though I do know there's a, a broken marriage in your past, but I didn't realize it was that broken. I do have a gun. But uh, no, my ex-wife is still alive. <laughs> well, we have a plot now for the next book now, don't we? <laughs> so you, uh, we, you, go, bleh, you have both mentioned um, setting and being in California. And, you know, California is such a kind of an iconic um thing in crime fiction kind of the whole west coast can you guys talk a little bit about um why you wanted to set the books in california and what are some of the challenges of setting them kind of in an area that kind of crime fiction readers know so well let's start with lee in my case it was a huge burden i wanted to write a police procedural but what am i going to say about los angeles that raymond chandler and joseph wamba and robert crace and michael Connolly and t jefferson parker haven't done and done better I mean, I'm just going to make a fool out of myself. And on top of that, all these television shows have been shot in Los Angeles. We're mm -hmm. sick of shows about Los Angeles cops. I mean, I, there's no way I could do it. But then I realized there was a way, which is I'm not writing about Los Angeles proper. I'm writing about the Lost Hills jurisdiction of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. And it is an island within Los Angeles that includes Calabasas, Hidden Hills, Topanga Canyon, the Santa Monica Mountains, Malibu. It includes state parks. It includes movie sets. It includes rural people. It includes hippy-dippy people. It includes some of the richest and most powerful people in the world. It It is a world unto itself, but surrounded by conflict because the borders are Los Angeles County Police Department, Ventura County Sheriff's Department. It, it, there's a lot of jurisdictional heat. And you're dealing with some of the richest and most powerful and well-known people in the world living in, in this little island within Los Angeles. It's also geographically very, very interesting. So it, it allowed me to explore something that none of these other authors have touched. Plus having a character who is in her 20s, doesn't know it all, isn't the typical middle-aged white, really skilled detective who's misunderstood by his bosses and carrying a dark secret that his you know, family was murdered by serial killers and he lost a testicle in Vietnam and he's still addicted to alcohol and neosinephrine, whatever, um, gave me a fresh way to approach the police procedural with a character who has a lot to learn and makes a lot of mistakes and doing it from a woman's point of view, a young woman's point of view. And, and that also has to do with a sense of place because it's all through her perspective, how she sees the world around her. But in the case also of Los Angeles, there's also an attitude that I could do that's different. I look at Los Angeles 
differently than Michael Connolly and Robert Crace. Because I, I, I straddle this fence between being a novelist and working in television. When, when you live in Los Angeles, you're living in a place where dreams are made, where all these TV shows and movies are shot. They aren't just shot on, on movie studio backlots. They're shot on our streets. The entire city is a stage. There are virtually no streets that haven't been a fictional street in some TV show somewhere, or even a fictional city. I mean, so many times Marina Del Rey has been Florida. You know, it's just yeah. so everyone walking through L.A. is an extra in somebody else's movie. And, and it's hard not to be impacted by the fictional L.A., when you're living in LA, especially if you're a character who's like Eve Ronan, who got where she is because of a viral video. So that clash between the fantasy Los Angeles and the real Los Angeles is in itself a sense of place and a character in my books and something I'm constantly exploring. I, I'm a lazy writer. I, I have the same themes in all my books, but this allows me to approach the themes in a, in a different way. I don't How, buy the lazy part. I'm sorry? I don't buy the lazy part. <laughs> oh, I'm lazy. I'm lazy. And how about you, Matt? Well, um, I write about greater San Diego and, and uh, a lot centered in La Jolla. Um, there are a lot of great uh, mystery writers in San Diego, more than people know, but not that many write about San Diego, ironically. I'm not sure why. Um, so I feel like there's, it's still a pretty much, um, you know, unhoed uh, lot or, or uh, field, you might say, unhoed. I'm not sure what that means. So I didn't. I didn't really worry. I didn't worry about that too much. I didn't. You know, I actually had people ask me, "Why aren't you putting this in L.A.?" You know, well, I, I it's a San Diego story. It's a San Diego character. There's a little bit of difference, but not that much. And the one thing when I was writing, um, when I was writing the first draft, and something Leek probably can't remember. He probably never did this because he's been writing for so long. But when I was, I I graduated with a degree in English from, as we talked about UC Santa Barbara. And I always thought I was gonna be a writer, you know, and I told people I was gonna be a writer for years. As I was working in the restaurant business and golf business and whatever else. So I made the mistake of talking about it, but not doing very much writing. And so when I finally had written a first draft, I thought it was a book, it's first draft. I went down to uh, FedEx Kinko's at the time and printed it out. And cause people at work would say, Hey, I heard you're a writer. I go, yeah, let me, <laughs> Why don't you read this? You know, you're, you're showing somebody a first draft from uh, your very first book. So I think about every time now, whenever I'm on, whenever uh, something, my, one of my book comes out and I'm in the paper or something, people that probably read that first draft are going, God, I read that guy. He can't write at all. Um, but the thing was, I had fictionalized La Jolla because it's got its own police department in uh, the Rick Cahill books, which is not true. La Jolla doesn't. It's not its own city in this in the books. It is. And um, my brother, because I, I, I thought that mattered. It doesn't matter. My brother-in-law, who had the misfortune of having to read a first uh, draft, too, and saying he liked it, lying to me, to my face. But uh, he said, you know, there's one thing. He goes, why don't you call, uh, I think I call it La Esmeralda or something as a nod to Chandler. Why don't you just call La Jolla? People from all around the world know La Jolla. It's got cachet. And, I, and that was probably the best advice I've ever gotten um, from anybody because, um, yeah, what difference does it make if Lloyd didn't have a police department? You know, everything in the book is fiction, blah, blah, blah. So once I got that um, idea, then it, it opened things up to me or I didn't have to make it, you know, I could, didn't have to make up things uh, as I went around town. But the idea is I wanted to have it in La Jolla for one reason too, is I wanted to have the police force. I've, I have law enforcement in my extended family and I respect uh, my member, members of my family a lot who do the job. I didn't want it to, to be, you know, the entire police force to be this, um, you know, corrupt thing. And, but I figure I'll have a smaller police force. I can make it corrupt to some degree. There's less civilian oversight. I can have some corruption and, you know, make it maybe a little more realistic with getting away with some things that um, they really couldn't do. But, I, but I want to make that fictional. I didn't want to be San Diego PD. Although I've had San Diego PD in a few books. Um, so another thing I wanted to touch on, um, you guys have both done kind of a wide array of stuff. Like Lee, you've co-written with authors, you've written for TV, you've done novelizations. Matt, you've done short stories, you've edited anthologies, you host a podcast. Can you guys talk a little bit about kind of how all of these different kinds of storytelling impact writing novels? Well, for me, the biggest influence on my novels is probably the work I do in television. Um, I've done a lot of television. And one of the things I like about writing a script is the, the energy of it. That how, how it moves and how, because of the nature of television, you only have 40, 
four minutes to tell a story, every scene has to count. Right. Every line of dialogue has to reveal character or move the story forward, or both. There has to be conflict in every single scene. And because when you write a script, it's a it's a working document that other professionals are using to do their jobs. It's not prose. It's you know, int bookstore day. Two authors are talking. One of them looks just like James Bond, and then you, you go from there. Um, <laughs> And I wanted to capture that same sort of energy in my books. Mm -hmm. So specifically with these Eve Ronan books, I want my writing to disappear. I want you to not be aware of it. I want you to be so caught up in what the characters are saying and doing, you forget you're reading a book, that you're just seeing the images in your mind. So I care, I'm very careful about not having writing that calls attention to itself. I don't have a clever turns of phrase. I don't have a, 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 a snide point of view. There are no you know, brilliant metaphors. I'm just doing the job to move the story forward. If I have a line that is really good in the prose, I cut it because I or I try to put it in a character's mouth because I want to capture that same energy of a feature film or of a, a TV show when you're reading these Eve Ronan novels. That is really, really hard to do. It sounds simple, but it's the hardest writing I've ever done to make my writing unobtrusive. With the exception of the opening paragraph or two of each book, Lost Hills and Bone Canyon, the authorial voice is gone. And if there's an observation to make, my characters make it. And I move the story forward through action and dialogue and not exposition and not internal monologues and not backstory. That's also very hard. But that's something I learned from TV. Because in television, if you don't see it and they don't say it, it doesn't exist. And I, I'm getting more and more bored with authors who use internal monologues and exposition as a crutch for actually telling a story with narrative momentum. And so, so in many ways, television has informed and helped my, my book career. As far as all the different kinds of writing I've done, I'm not a writer. I'm not an author. I'm not a TV writer. I'm a writer. Writers write. And I do whatever I need to do to make a living for my family or to take the best opportunities that come along, whether that be novelizations or co-authoring books or writing a whodunit or writing a spy thriller or writing you know, a TV series for Hallmark. I'm always writing and also trying to challenge myself. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think Lee just described the things not to do is how Lee just described my writing. So we got that covered. Now that's a separate email coming. <laughs> um, I'm joking. No, I'm actually, I, I, write no I only write novels. Um, I wrote, I've written one short story in that since I got out of college, which was in the early 30s. Um, and I never did anything with it. I stuck it in a, I stuck it in a um, desk drawer, and then um, Paul Marks asked me if I wanted to be a part of this anthology that he did a few years ago. And I said, well, I was in the middle of writing a book, and I don't write that fast. So I said, I don't write short stories, and I, but I got this thing I could polish for you. And I polished it up. I made it a lot better. And uh, it ended up being the anthology, and you got nominated for a couple of awards. So I figured I got that bucket list covered. But um, now I just write novels. That's what I do. Um, the podcast, I love having the podcast. Lee was actually my very first guest or sort of my second guest because I technically, uh, had some technical difficulties when I was trying to interview, um, Robin Brissell and, uh, never got her on the air, but you can hear if you, it's actually available. You can find me ranting to myself for four minutes and then I almost lost Lee too. So he had to call in. Uh, so that was good. First couple of, yeah, but I had Lee as my first guest, but yeah, I love, I love, uh, picking other authors brains and I love talking to them, um, for the podcast, but. I just really did. Anthologies are good. I mean, I've, I've been in, a, I've been in a writers groups for ever since I started writing for real. So mm -hmm. that, that does help the critiquing. I think the critiquing helps you as much as being critiqued because it makes you look at things a little differently. Um, so that is something that's ongoing. Um, so that is, that's definitely helpful and, and uh, nice to have other eyes on the work. But um, I basically just write novels and I've been asked a few times to write for anthologies. I'm always behind in the novel I'm writing and I just say, well, I don't really have an idea to write a short story. But, my uh, brother is really good at writing short stories. And my brother, Todd Goldberg, who's a yeah. very successful writer. He's a good author too. But he started at writing short stories. In fact, he just had a collection of short stories called The Low Desert that Publishers Weekly called a masterpiece. They just, they went crazy for it. That's really what he loves. And he does that even better than he does his, his great novels. I think in my entire career, 
I've written maybe six short stories or seven, and I find them very hard. Um, I just wrote one for a Lawrence Block anthology, and I was really nervous about sending it to him. I thought, oh God, whatever respect he has for me is going to be gone. And, <laughs> and to my surprise, you know, he liked it. So, so we'll see. Um, I actually, it's so funny you mentioned short stories. There's a short story I have been working on for like 15 years between books. I'll, I'll go and add a paragraph and potchkey with it. I finally decided this week, you know what? I'm sick of that damn file in my drawer. I'm going to finish it during the pandemic. And I don't know what I'll ever do with it because it's a short story that's 10,000 words. So it's hardly a short story. <laughs> um, but it's just, I, I, I'd rather put that time into a novel. I just, um, yeah. and the short story field, to be honest, is not one that's very lucrative. It may not be worth the time. There are not that many markets for them. Actually, I'm not entirely being honest. I wrote a bunch of short stories for Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine, but they were chapters from my monk novels. I yeah. only think my monk novels had monks solve a big crime and like two or three little ones off <laughs> off the top of his head. And, right. and they turned out to be excellent short stories. I can't remember who it was who, who told it to me. Brendan Dubois or someone said, you know, Lee, you've got short stories in every one of your monk novels. I, I do? Yeah, just pull out chapter three. You can sell it to Ellery Queen tomorrow. And that's what I did. So wow. I do have a bunch of, of of Adrian Monk short stories, but they weren't conceived as short stories. They were conceived as as mysteries he solves to irritate people, whatever, in the midst of the bigger mystery that he's solving. So it, it came out kind of sideways. And I, I tricked myself into writing those short stories. Yeah, so, to, to touch upon what Lee said, I do find them hard. I, to me, it's harder than writing a novel, although obviously a lot shorter, but... So I just don't really, I don't really put my time into them. No, I won't mention somebody. Who, do it, but I don't do it. I won't mention him by name, but there's a writer you and I both know who once went up. I won't even mention who the famous writer was because it'll still identify this guy who went up to a very famous New York Times bestselling author and said, "I haven't written a novel yet, but I write short stories, which are a lot harder than what you do. I challenge you to write a short story." And he talked about all the short stories he'd done and and how you know. It's so much more difficult than the work this New York Times bestselling author was doing. And I just, I want to dig a hole in the ground. I was so embarrassed. And it's just, and, and to the big time author's credit, um, he didn't put this guy down. He just said, you may be right about that. Maybe someday I will try to rise to your level and, and write a short story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I got to find out who that was. I'll, I'll tell you off camera sometime. But <laughs> my, my brother was with me. We were just like, oh, God. <laughs> I can't believe he's doing this. That's one of the downsides to the virtual events is because this is recorded on the internet everywhere. You don't right. get all of those like little bits of gossip that you could get sitting in a bookstore with a crowd of people. You like you don't get those in real time. Right. Oh no. I always assume when I'm in a bookstore that whatever I'm saying, even if it's just one little old lady who thinks I'm Lori King is in the audience and and no one else. I still am very careful about what I say because I know it will be sent out to the world. I've learned this the hard way. I mean, I, I'll tell you a very quick story. And, and Matt may have been there. Um, there was a Men of Mystery event where Dean Koontz spoke. And Dean Koontz told a horribly racist anecdote. And I got up and walked out of the room, and so did about 25 other authors got up and walked out. And I wrote on my blog that day that I thought what Dean Koontz did was showed very poor judgment. Next day, I'm asleep. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. My wife is waking me up. What's the matter with you? How could you have done that to the Los Angeles Times? She's French. Are you out of your mind? I said, what are you talking about? On the front page of the of the Los Angeles Times headline, Goldberg calls Kuntz racist. Like, what? <laughs> Look at this article. And it, it didn't mention it was a blog post. And it made it seem like I just you know decided to call Dean Kuntz a racist, which I didn't, by the way. I said his comment was racially insensitive, but you know it, there it was. It went out, you know, and I I had to deal with all of that. I didn't I didn't uh, take back anything I said. I still stood behind all my comments, but I did demand a retraction from the Los Angeles Times to say it was on a blog, and I was not the only one there. And you know, a lot of other people blogged about this stuff, so I'm very careful um, about. I mean, there's a famous director I criticized in a blog post and was stunned when he called me out on Twitter. Like, What's he doing reading my blog? So I never put anything on a blog or anything in it. Well, tweets are out there in the world. But you know, anything out there, even in things like this, that I wouldn't want to see on the front page of the Los Angeles Times tomorrow morning. Because you by the way, you can find that Koontz thing by just Googling Goldberg and, and Koontz. Were you there, Matt? I can't remember. 
No, no. We'll remember that one. Oh, Greg Hurwitz was there and my brother Todd and a bunch of other folks. We just all got up and walked out. It was just really awful. Wow. You know, you could have leveraged that uh, L.A. Times front page thing into becoming a homicide cop. If you and and I, I should it. qualify that. I said the front page of the L.A. Times. That's not true. It was the front page of the calendar section of the Los Angeles Times. Okay. I, have to, I want to be seen as exaggerating. Okay. <laughs> um, so, Lee, you mentioned wanting to get this short story done kind of in the middle of COVID pandemic. What has been your writing process with all of this going on? Have you been able to sit down? And I realize all of this going on, there is a lot going on. Have you been actually able to like sit down and write? I've been very fortunate in that at the beginning of the pandemic, I had contractual obligations. I had a book that was due. And it wasn't clear how long the pandemic would last. I owed Hallmark Network two scripts. Oh. So I was actually very busy. Even though you know they ended up not shooting those two movies in April like they intended, I still had to write them and I had a book due. Um, so I was really busy until about September 15th, somewhere in there. Uh, actually, I take it back, Octo October 1st. I was, I was busy writing a book and two scripts. And plus I have a small publishing company, Brash Books. And thank you, by the way, for carrying some of our titles. So I, I had lots to keep me busy. And it wasn't until October when all that was over with, like, like Chasing Jack by our good friend Parnell Hall, um, that I suddenly had nothing to do, nothing to distract me. In fact, this is the first time probably in 30 years that I have nothing. I mean, I have no contracts. I don't owe anybody any scripts. I don't owe anybody any books. And I'm not quite sure what to do with myself. I'm kind of thankful that I have a book out now to promote in the middle of an insurrection, and I have an insurrection to watch, so I have an excuse not to write anything. How about you, Matt? How's it been for you getting writing done? Well, I like Lee, although not to uh, the extent of uh, obligations he had. I, I was under contract for getting a book done, um, and I was behind when it hit. I was having a hard time getting the, writing, beginning this next book. And um, ironically, I actually got, maybe not ironically, but I got, I got more work once I finally found my thread in the book, I got more work done. I don't really, I can't say it had anything to do with the, the pandemic. I quit my day job two years ago. So I've been, you know, doing nothing but writing um, since then. So it didn't change that much, although it did. It's funny. I, I'm not, I'm not uh, a very social person uh, except for events like this or, or conferences. So I don't, it didn't affect my social life too much. I actually improved it in some ways, but um, but I did find, even though even though I live alone and my life didn't change much, just the whole not being able to go to places I wanted to, go out and eat dinner that much, putting a mask on when you go outside, I think it affected me in, in ways I didn't really understand. I didn't, I didn't understand. I couldn't really un maybe understand why I was feeling a little depressed when how would your life change? But I, I just think the whole the weight of the whole situation um, was, you know, I had to deal with it, but I, nothing nothing significant like a lot of people. But I was more productive. So um, once I finally found the thread, so that there's some good in that. I mean, I don't want to shrug off the uh, that. My answer to your question may have been a little bit too lighthearted. I've I've oh, lost I, so. I, I lost people that I I care deeply about. People right. I've known for a long time to COVID, and so I have had their passing um, to deal with during the pandemic, and that's been hard. And and dealing and that's the other thing. I don't want to get political. But when you're dealing with the loss of a, of a good friend, of a loved one, at the same time, people are telling you that what killed them doesn't exist, that it's fake, that everyone is being overwrought, don't wear a mask, social distancing is bad, let us go to our restaurants. And it, it makes the pain harder to deal with. It makes it harder to, to, let, to let them go because it, it feels like people are urinating on the death of your friend. Uh, or your family member. And so that, that's been difficult. But I think everybody's dealing with that. I think the level of death in our country, particularly in Southern California, which yeah. is now a hot spot, has been so strong. I don't think there are many people around now who can't say they don't know somebody who has died, who has, who, 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 they don't know somebody who's been affected by the death of a loved one due to COVID-19. Well, right. and, and, and to Matt's point, you know, there's, there's, there's one thing to be said about I'm in my house and I don't want to leave my house because I don't want to go out in the world as opposed to I'm in my house and I can't go out in the world because I have to put on a mask because there's a deal. So there's definitely a difference between, yeah, I like to stay home and well, crap, I can't go anywhere. Um, and I have family who are dealing with severe financial hardship because of the pandemic. Right. You know, I don't want to be facetious either about restaurants. Obviously, <laughs> We all want restaurants to survive. We want bookstores to survive. We all want all of our, our favorite businesses to survive. 
It's just, it's so horrible out there. So in some ways though, I'm, we were saying this before the show or before the, the, this event, writers are lucky because we can weather the pandemic by burrowing into our imagination the way we always do. In that regard, our way of life hasn't changed all that much. I am still sitting at my desk, making stuff up and, and, and by doing so, dealing with my own stresses and anxieties and fears and insecurities as I was before the pandemic. I don't get to sit in the bar at a conference with Matt and talk shop. I don't get to travel to research my books, but I'm one of the very, very lucky ones. And I thank God for it every day. And, and you know, on the flip side, the, the work that you're doing, both of you guys are doing, the, the, the work, the, the writing the books and getting out in the, out in the world is doing a lot to help people. I mean, one of the things we've heard so many people come in and talk about is being able to have stories and being able to have books to kind of get themselves lost in when they're able to is a huge huge, huge help, help right now, um, which will lead me into my next question then. Um, what have you guys read lately that you loved? Um, what's some stuff that, that you're super excited about? Let's start with Matt. All right. I just read Bell Canyon. Really like that. <laughs> um, I've been reading. I've read this book. blind book I've been reading. <laughs> I've, um, yeah, I mean, I, I read some good things for uh, some, some blurbs lately. I'm going to be reading a lot more uh, very soon, a lot more, um, and that's going to be interesting. Um, but um, yeah, I did like I like Connolly's last book, um, Law of Innocence. I think really like that. But uh, you know, nothing that's really um, I've fallen in love with, unfortunately. I've I've been reading a lot lately. And like like Matt, you get stuck reading a lot of things you have to blurb, which is you know fun, but also kind of a burden because you're not reading what you want to read. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I really enjoyed. I caught up with November Road, you know, Lou Burney's book. Oh, yeah. uh, I, I really enjoyed. I've been on an Anthony Horowitz binge. I, I really like the word is murder and the sentence is death, and the the new one, the Moon Moonflower Moonglow Murders, Moonflower. the mm -hmm. the sequel to his fantastic book Magpie Murders. And uh, I just read a book that's not a mystery, but maybe stocked in your store, uh, Plain Bad Heroines by, looking up on my shelf, Emily Danforth. <laughs> terrific book. Absolutely terrific. Loved it. Unlike anything I've read in a while. I also liked S.A. Cosby's um, Black, Black, Black Top. Boys. Yeah, that was Black a terrific Top. book. Yeah. I bought um, that. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. The, um, I, I, to my surprise, I enjoyed the, um, I just forgot the name of the character, Sonny Randall book. Uh, that that just came out. Um, I, I didn't like the first one that was done, but I like the the second by that uh, the new author. Um, I can't remember why I'm blanking on the new author's name of, of uh, Mike the, Lutica. Yeah, yeah. and uh, Wait, I think what else I've been reading. Mike I've been reading a lot of older books too. I, I this is kind of a plug for my one of my publishing company imprints, but I, I read a terrific book by uh, Bud Clifton from the '50s called The Murder Specialist. Terrific book been out of print for 60 years wow. great book about a, um, a hired killer and i'm reading a book now by a guy who's incapable of writing a bad novel one of the most dependable and in many ways the best thriller writer out there i'm reading thomas perry's eddie's boy oh. tom perry has never written a bad book in his life he is absolutely dependable he's like the eddie boy uh professional killer in his book he is a total pro i mean his books are just so good and so satisfying, and for me, they're they're comfort reading. Nice guy, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He looks like a an action adventure writer, doesn't he, Matt? I mean, he just <laughs> he carries himself like a stone killer. He's Absolutely. got the body of an assassin and, and yeah. the temperament. And so for everybody who's watching, we actually did an event with Thomas Perry at the beginning of December, and you can go back and check that out on the store's YouTube channel. We also did a uh, ticketed event with Anthony Horowitz that ended up being like an, the, the Saturday that the election was finally called, like an hour beforehand. So Anthony tuned in. He's like, I have no idea who's going to watch this because wow. everything is happening in the world. Um, but there was a ticketed event, but we've just uploaded that uh, chat to the YouTube channel as well. So we did over 130 virtual events with over 200 authors in wow. 2020. Um, wow. And you can catch all of those on the store's Facebook uh, and YouTube channel. We've got a huge, great lineup uh, coming up for this year. So before we head out tonight, do you guys have any questions for each other? No, I, have question, uh, so. I have a question about Eve Ronan. Um, how did you come about that title? I mean, that title, you mean her name? Her name, right. 
Um, that's a good question. I mean, how, yeah. you, how, you know what it means. You know, it came from yeah. something. But it's funny. I, I actually had, and it's been cut from, I've written the third book, by the way. It's coming out October 5th of 2021. It's called Gated Prey. So it's it's the book I was rushing to finish during the pandemic. But each one, I've had the scene where I explain how that her name, her, in the book, Eve's mother is a, a struggling actress whose career has gone nowhere. And her maiden name was Ronan. And she changed it to Ronan because she thought it was cooler. And now Eve's stuck with that Ronan last name, which kind of fits her personality. But the explanation for the name keeps getting cut from, from the books for, for various reasons. But I, 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 Eve, I guess for Adam and Eve, I just want a, a character name that would summarize what a loner she is and how relentless she is yeah. and her passion for justice. And I wanted something memorable. And I, you know, I didn't want to call her, you know, Eve Brownstein or something. I, I wanted something that, you know, like Rebus or Bosch or or Morse. You know, I, I, there's the also in the back of my mind there was the possibility of television. And I, and I should say I, I can't reveal any details, but a, a major network and a major production company have optioned the book, and there's a pilot script being written. I have nothing to do with it, but I'm sure if they go forward with it, it'll be called Ronan. And isn't that a nice grabber of a of a name? Yeah, it's a great name. Maybe they also may want an option of Hollywood and Vine. <laughs> Hollywood and the Vine. Oh, and the Vine? Okay. Half man, half cop. Half man, half plant, all cop. Right. <laughs> um, so, Matt, where did uh, Rick's name come from? Because, you know, as a PI, they have to have kind of a good PI name. So where did you get Rick Cahill from? Yeah, good question. Um, I wanted to have the initials RC as an homage to Raymond Chandler. Mm. And I, I like the hard C, the hard C um, sound, Rick. Cahill, and uh, because of my Irish descent, I wanted to be um, wanted him to have an Irish name, and I looked up all these different names, and Cahill worked, and uh, so I went with it, and then uh, <laughs> Rick Cahill, that's good. So uh, I remember my wife was, my ex-wife was reading uh, something, an early version or something, she goes, his name's Rick Cahill? <laughs> so some people still don't get the Cahill, but uh, because I always got it from John Wayne's movie, uh, Cahill. Cahill, U.S. Marshal, yeah. Yeah, right. Right. Well, now we know why you divorced her. I mean, come on. Right. Yeah. She divorced me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. So uh, just to recap, if you guys have tuned into the chat midway, we have been talking with Lee Goldberg about his new book, um, Bone Canyon. And we have also been chatting with Matt Coyle about his new book, book Blind Visual. Both are available at Murder by the Book. Uh, we are open for browsing so you guys can come on in. We understand that not everybody is still comfortable coming into the store. So if you just want to do curbside pickup, we're doing curbside pickup. You can reach us over the phone. We're available online. Um, we're happy to run books out to the car. Um, like I said, we've got a lot of great stuff coming up. We're going to be chatting with Jason Pinter next week. We've got an event with um, Greg Hurwitz coming up at the end of January, and he's going to have two of his... Um, kind of research people that help him out with books. Be uh, He's going to be chatting with them. And then I think next Tuesday, we're chatting with uh, Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child. So lots of really good stuff yeah. coming up. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm so sorry we're not able to do this in the store, but fingers crossed before long, we will actually be able to get people back in the store. We can have can't you guys wait back. to come back. Can't wait to stain another shirt with barbecue. Awesome. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for having us. And sorry you have to slum after we leave with all those offices. <laughs> <All those packs. laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, y'all have a good night. Thank you so much. You too. Thanks, man. Broadcast.